Great to see you this morning. Glad that you are here, continuing to brave the weather. This is a good place. We gather this morning in the presence of God, and we seek, as we gather, to experience Him in new and fresh ways. I welcome you to Grace Chapel this morning, where we truly endeavor to practice community worship together. You know, one of the things I love about Tacoal Falls College is the fact that we are, and institutionally, historically, have been committed to the mission of God in the world. And one of the cool things is to be able to rub shoulders with many of you as students who come here because you want to truly participate in God's mission. But one of the things that we're learning this semester, and one of the things that we're learning this week, is that we actually engage in God's mission all right, out of a vital experience of God's presence in our own lives and in the life of his people. So how can we begin to return and begin to pursue mission out of that posture of presence, the very presence of God, to allow that to be the, the cistern out of which we draw strength, that cistern out of which we begin to move into the world, out of the de deep well of God's presence in our lives and in our life as a people. So we want to explore that this morning. I hope you've come. I hope you are preparing your hearts to not only experience God, but to respond to Him this morning in new and fresh ways. I want to invite you to stand. And let us pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, Thank you for inviting us into this place. Thank you for the presence of your spirit. Lord, this morning, we open ourselves individually and as a community to the work of your spirit. Speak to us, O oh God. Challenge us. Give us a, a, a renewed imagination for how we can engage in your mission, God, out of a deep and vital experience of your presence in us and in us as a people pray that you would do this, this day, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And the community of TFC said, amen. Let's continue to worship this morning as we sing together.
16 through 18 says, This is what the Lord says He who made a path through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. So as we sing this next song, it talks about the new thing that the Lord is doing in us. And he gave us his Holy Spirit as that awesome new thing. We don't have to strive and try to earn our salvation, but he's already given us his spirit, which is how we live our new life. So let's sing this next song and just sing about what he's already done for us and what he's trying to do in his new things. crushing in the pressing you were making new wine in the soil I now surrender you were breaking new ground so I yield to you and to your careful when I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing. But all you have given me, Jesus, bring
you want me to be God I came here with nothing but all you have given me Jesus bring new wine out of me Jesus bring new wine out of me Jesus bring new wine out of me Lord we thank you for the new work that you're doing in us thank you for your spirit Thank you that we don't have to strive and earn our salvation, but that you've given it to us freely and that your spirit dwells inside of us daily. It is your presence that gives us life, Lord. We are so thankful. We are a grateful people. Let us sit in thankfulness this morning as we listen to the word. In your name I pray, amen. I invite you to be seated this morning. Back in 2008, I took up a post at Wesley Biblical Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi, and we were really grappling as an institution about how we, in our curriculum and in our life together there at that little seminary, could, could be more missional in our approach to the gospel and in our engagement with the world. And I remember in those early years, I came across an author by the name of David Fitch. For me, my entree into what he was talking about was the great giveaway. Um, and then through blog posts and, and other writings, um, it was the work of David Fitch that played a role in helping shape the kinds of things that we were talking about there at the seminary um, and helping us develop a new imagination for what God was up to in the world and how we could begin to participate in that work. Um, so I'm excited for David Fitch to be here with us this week as he begins to, to give us a vision of who we're called to be as the church, and how we, all right, how we as 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 the church can can really engage in mission. Um, another thing that David's involved with is not just his work at Northern Seminary, although that's profound, and they're doing a good bit to to mentor and to shape new pastoral leaders to serve in the kind of thing that he's talking about. But a number of years ago, he was also instrumental, one of the founding uh, members or. or uh, uh, authors of the Missio Alliance. Many of you have probably heard about that. Um, it's, a, it's a group, it's a network of people across all kinds of denominations that are seeking to really re-engage theology and really engage what it means to do practical ministry as they seek, as we seek, to really minister here in an American context that is post-Christian. Um, and so he's doing coaching not only at Northern, but has done coaching with people all over the nation in order to help shape the kinds of things that he's talking about. And so I'm glad that he's with us here to talk about those things. And uh, let's give him another TFC welcome this morning as he comes to share. Okay, we're going to dance up here or something. <laughs> Good to be back here again. Uh, it's been a great day and a half uh, of being on your campus I really sense that God's doing stuff here among you, and so uh, I pray this time together will be helpful. Um, I uh, started out yesterday by talking about the three P's of a missional ecclesiology, uh, uh, presence, practices, places. Last night I talked about places, three places, three circles. Today I'd like to talk about presence. God's presence and how he works in the world. And then tonight, I'll talk about practices and how all this fits together to open up space for the gospel. That'll be tomorrow, tomorrow's last session. So thanks for having me. Are you awake this morning? You, dude, you are always on fire. And I don't even know your name, but I, I don't want to point you out right now. It might not be good, but anyways... All right, uh, let me begin by uh, talking about this guy named R.J. Cooper. He was a restaurateur in Providence, Rhode Island. He was in a US Today, USA Today story about uh, five years ago. And he was having a restaurant built. You know how they do a build-out. And the person, uh, the contractor, asked him, do you want charging stations, uh, smartphone charging stations at the tables. Do you want them installed? And all of a sudden, R.J. Cooper gets very animated. 
he gets, uh, um, um, he starts saying bad words. He, he starts saying expletive, expletive, no, no. He says, cell phones are ruining my restaurant. People can't even sit in, uh, around a table without looking at their, their smart noticing the ambiance of the restaurant. It takes them five times longer to order from the menu. He said, no, 100% expletive, no. I want no charging stations at the tables of my restaurant. To me, this symbolizes, this is a metaphor for what's happening in our culture today, what's happening with all of us living in North America. We are so busy and distracted and unable to give our attention to one another, never mind the presence of God. We have architected God out of our existence. We have organized our lives in such a way that he does not matter. We focus more on our bank accounts, more on our programs, more in... If, if we're parents, more on our children doing 52 different programs a week. We have architected God out of our existence. Most of us haven't even noticed. We've been rushing back and forth. For, to, the, to the people uh, not in college, I mean... The world out there, they're rushing back and forth to meetings, to malls, to kids' sports programs, to doing jobs, to bank accounts, to worrying about paying bills, to having a respectable career. All the while missing that God is present all around us. For most people in the West, God is an individual belief. A personal, private experience. Something we fit in. Between all the other things we're doing in our lives. And what this means is God does no longer exist for us. Because once you start fitting God into your life, he's no longer God. You've got to fit yourself before God and his life. A.W. Tozer said, I've noticed his name in the entryway. A.W. Tozer said, quote, God's presence is the central fact of Christianity. The heart of the Christian message is, and listen to this, that God is waiting for us to push into conscious awareness of his presence. The dominant theme of the Bible is God's presence. Through the entire scriptures, we see it. It is by his presence that God works. If you start from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, the Garden of Eden, God created the heavens and the earth. John Walton, the uh, Old Testament scholar, says... Garden of Eden is built according to the dimensions of a sanctuary for God's presence. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. The fall happened. Adam and Eve, uh, the fall happened and Adam and Eve are now uh, fallen from God. And the first thing that kind of happens is God's looking for Adam and Eve. Things similar to... Um, Adam. Adam, okay. Why are you hiding from my presence? After many years of suffering in Egypt, God manifests his presence to Moses. God has gone about the the, uh, the task of renewing his presence to humanity through this nation of Israel. And so he manifests his presence to Moses at the burning bush. 
And he sends Moses to deliver his people. And in that sending, God promises in Exodus 3 to be with Moses. With him. With, that word means I'm going to be present with you. Not for you, not over you, not to you, with you. This is the pattern of how God sends his people. It runs constant through the whole entirety of the story of the Bible. God says, I'm going to send you, and I'm going to be with you, and my presence is going to be with you. And the church is called to be the presence of God in the world, making space for his presence. Presence is the way God works. Moses goes after this whole thing with the, with the pharaohs and, and everything. Moses ends up at the Mount of Sinai again, and he's up there, and the golden calf incident happens, and Moses is up there, and God's a little angry, and uh, I mean, not a little, a, a, a lot angry, uh, and he says something like this, I've had it with you people, I've had it. The golden calf incident, stiff-necked, I am withdrawing my presence from you. Exodus 33. Uh, Moses says something like, oh, are you kidding me? If you withdraw your presence from us, there is no more reason for us to go on. We are no longer your people. And, and then God relents. It's a, there's a theological issue there which we can't go into right now. Nonetheless, I will take my presence. I will give you my presence. I will be present with you. And they go on. From there, we know the tabernacle is built to house God's presence among the people. Um, over and over again in the Psalms, God's presence. It's all about God's presence. Read, read Psalm 46. Listen to this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the people of God, the holy dwelling place of the most high dwelling place. Presence. God is in the midst of her presence. She will not be moved because when God is with you and you are present and he is present together with you, you cannot be moved. The nations made an uproar. The kings tottered. The Lord of hosts is with us. Could it be any more clear? Notice all these words, with, in the midst. Present, dwelling, place, they are all code words. They're some of the most important code words in the Bible for God's presence. His presence dispels violence, makes space for healing, for renewal, for reconciliation. It is by God's presence that he works. Years later, we got the temple standing right in the middle of Jerusalem the meeting place of the nation with God's presence. Then, through a series of events, the exile. People, the, the people become rebellious. They get exiled. The presence of God, it says in Ezekiel, left the temple. The temple was destroyed. But his promise was the presence of God would be restored. Ezekiel 37, let these dead bones live. The promise is delivered in the form of Jesus Christ, the Son of God made incarnate, God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. He becomes present in the flesh. The Word was made flesh, John 1, 14 says, and dwelt or tabernacled or became present with us. Am I making my point? God's presence. God's
God's presence is the way he works. It is the dominant theme. It is more dominant than kingdom. In fact, the kingdom shall be take shape through his presence. It is more dominant than monarchy or kingdom. In fact, 1 Samuel chapter 8, uh, uh, when Samuel says to God, they want a king, God says something like, give them a king like the Gentiles have. But tell them it's not going to work out. Because it's through my presence that I have chosen to work among a people. In the farewell discourses of John, Jesus says, if I go, the comforter will come in my place. Through the Holy Spirit, I will be present to you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. This is in the upper room. Breathes on them the Spirit. And says, my presence shall go with you. In the final chapter of the book of Revelation, we read about the coming of the new heavens and the new earth. Now, this is where we're all going. This is this whole story and where it's all ending. Right? Revelation 21. It says, this will be the place of God's temple. I mean, God's indwelling among humanity where no temple is needed. Chapter 21, verse 3, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among them now, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. Fully restored to God's presence. Scriptures from beginning to end tell the marvelous story of God returning his presence to all creation. The presence of God is the dominant theme in the entire Bible. It is by his presence that he works. Have you known the presence of God in your life? Have you known the presence of God in your churches? Have you known the presence of God in your neighborhoods where you, where you live when you go home on spring break or winter break or whatever it's called. More than just a cognitive belief, have you known, experienced God's presence? Not just in here, but out there. All around you as he's working. What is God's presence? Let's say uh, you're sitting at a table and you're drinking coffee with somebody. And you are being present to them. You're not on your smartphone device. You're not sizing them up. You're not criticizing their slurping habits or something like that. No, you're casting your attention onto them. And, and, and have you ever had someone do that to you? Oh, it feels so good. God does that with us and inhabits the world like that. You are not, think of it, when somebody does that to you, you are not distant to that person. You are not protecting yourself from that person. You are open to that person. That is a taste of presence. Let's, let's say you're on um, a first date with somebody. Have I got your attention? Let's say you're on a first date. You're uncomfortable. You're self-conscious. What is that other person thinking of me? You find yourself trying to be funny or entertaining. At least this is the way I used to be. Okay, I've got to make a joke. Maybe she'll laugh. Maybe she'll like me. That always fails. <laughs> there's, a lack of, there's a lack of connection going on here. I'm, I'm insecure. Over time, you share a meal with someone like 20 times. You grow to trust that person. Oh, is he or she trustworthy? Oh, and suddenly, even when you have disagreements, it's not like this person's just going to dump you and leave you and walk away because you had a disagreement. No, you are in this struggle together. That's presence. 
You're not striving to win an argument anymore. You are struggling with that person. You are being shaped in and with and alongside that person. It's amazing what happens with presence. Aren't we all dying for it? Don't we all want presence in our lives? Isn't that what we're longing for? The entirety of Scripture tells us that this is what God wants with us. This is with all humanity. Every time I get too excited, this thing turns off. And I'm asking, is this the Holy Spirit or is this technology going awry? I'm going I'm to go with technology going awry right now. Presence is the dominant theme in the Bible. It's the preeminent way God works. He's always working all around us through his presence. When he heals the world, it will be through his presence. When he unites two people in a broken relationship, it will be. It is always through his presence. If the antagonisms of our lives, all the angers and the hurts and the pains are ever going to be unwound, it will be through his presence. When sexuality gets all confused, broken, violent, it will only be unwound. It will only be changed. It will only be healed through his presence. When God judges in the Bible, out of an act of blatant rebellion of people against him, it is God who judges by withdrawing his presence. And then violence happens. But he is ever patient, ever full of compassion, slow to judgment, always longing, always longing to be present with us. The world hungers for his presence. A couple of years ago, my family and I moved to Westmont, Illinois, and a second ring suburb of Chicago on the southwest side, kind of middle to lower middle class. As is my custom, I find a place in town where people go. I go there to be present to God's presence in this place where the hurting people are, the least of these. So I decided to go look in the local pubs. And on the main drag, I was talking about this last night, there's this pot-bellied pub. It's where the hurting people go in my town. If, you were, if my mother was driving by, she would go something like, ugh. I never want to go into that place. It looks too dark and too dingy. They do have decent hamburgers and stale peanuts. Anyways, they started to have a few church meetings in the pub. There's an eating area over here. There's this very um, uh, cheap uh, pool table over here. Uh, we ate sat, ate pizza, sipped a Coca-Cola, and I remember one night sitting there with a group of, of, of people, and I looked over at the bar area, and there's like three dudes, old dudes, like older than me dudes. Two of them had Vietnam War veterans hats on. And I remember saying to Lori, I said, do you see that blank stuff? That blank stare in their eyes. Do you see the sadness on their faces as they sipped their alcohol to deaden the pain? Longing to know forgiveness. Longing to know acceptance. Longing to heal, have healing in their wounds and all the repercussions in their lives. They are people longing for his presence. And this picture has stuck with me to this day as I hang out there tending to his presence. The world hungers for his presence daily. Christians 
try to hold our lives together and we walk in isolation and protection from other people. We're so busy trying to control our own lives. We roam frantically in a sea of disconnected souls. The world is longing to be connected to his presence. The church's primary task is to be present to his presence. That's your primary task. To be present to his presence. Faithful presence names this reality that God is present in the world. And he uses a people. Faithful to his presence to make himself concrete and real and visible. This is the way God works. So when the church becomes faithful to his presence, God's presence, his kingdom becomes visible. And the world says, whoa, I want some of that. Tonight I want to talk about how his presence is made visible through his practices that he's given to us. How his presence is at work in the whole world. But he comes to be specially present among his people. We who have made him Lord by virtue of our willingness to surrender to him make space for his presence to be made known, concrete, visible. You remember that time Jesus walked away in Matthew from this place in Palatine saying, I cannot do any miracles there. They had no faith could have said it like this I cannot do anything there because they did not make space for my presence will you make space for his presence in your life will you make space for his presence in all your relationships will you make space for his presence in all the hurting places in the world that God has privileged you to be. I close with this. Steve was a man in McDonald's without a home. I met him in McDonald's after like two years. And Steve was homeless. He'd been without a home for three years. And Steve starts saying some crazy stuff to me. I, he starts sitting down with me. We're, we're, we're at a table, McDonald's coffee. And he says, Dave, there's a conspiracy. There's a conspiracy between Barack Obama, Mars, and us. And they're planting um, uh, chips in people's brains. Okay, now, I, normally I would have said, Steve, I got to go. This is nuts. But I prayed, Lord, help me be present. You are working even in this. He said the story two or three times. And then finally I said, Steve, I know, I get it. Barack Obama, Mars, conspiracy, he's planting chips in our brains and blah, blah, blah. What's going on with you? What? Somebody's asking me about me and my life? Space has opened up. Steve starts telling me about his life. That opened up a whole space for God to work in Steve's life all the broken relationships in his life and the five or six other people without homes that met in McDonald's regularly. Presence is the way God works. Five years earlier, I would have said, I got to get out of here, Steve. You're crazy. No. God is at present and at work in all things. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God is already working. Will we bring this harvest to fruition? Tonight I talk about practices for doing that. Let us be present to his presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Well, this is an important day in the life of our country. We're praying today for the election process for the direction of our country itself. As we move into this time, I, I can't let this time go by without inviting you to respond to the implicit message 
that David was sharing this morning. Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you living a frenzied life? Have you so architectured God out of your life? And this morning, you heard the voice of God's Spirit inviting you into His presence in new and fresh ways. In this next moment, I just want to invite you to bow your head or don't bow your head. Close your eyes or don't close your eyes. But to respond to that invitation of the Spirit, yeah, to give yourself, submit yourself to a different kind of life, one that is pervaded by His presence, and in so doing, to find life. Let's just take this next moment. I invite you to pray. Heavenly Father, just as each of us have come before you this morning, ask for you to work in new and fresh ways in and through your presence with us. We come before you today because our country is hurting. Families are torn apart. Friends have turned to enemies. Lord, may we see how morally inconsistent we are, how self-righteous we can be, how fear has deeply poisoned our hearts, how the lust for power has blinded us to the gospel. Lord, deliver us from evil. May we all repent first before waiting for others to repent. Lord, before we can pray for unity, we must personally do the hard work of unmasking our own duplicity. Forgive us when we demonize another. Forgive us when we speak truth without love. Forgive us when our moral outrage is simply a facade covering our need to be right. Forgive us when we reduce love to simply being nice while we ignore injustice. Forgive us when we sin against another. And may we learn to forgive when we are sinned against. Lord, may the church be a prophetic and priestly voice. May we speak truth to power while offering healing to the oppressed and the oppressor. Teach us to be salt and light. May our speech be always filled with grace, seasoned with salt. Teach us to put our hope in you and to properly discern our civic responsibilities, having our lives marked by a non-anxious presence. Lord, before we speak, may our lives be marked by silence, but guard us from silence when you call us to speak. Lord, you are always at work, making all things new. Make us new people with new hearts who can join you in your presence in this project of restoration in our own lives, in our country, and in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. And the people of TSC said this morning, amen. Go in God's power and his peace. And his presence.